On September 9, 2009, Najib Bulazazi was about to enter New York City when police stopped his car on the George Washington Bridge. New York said there is absolutely no way on this earth we will allow this individual, knowing what we know about him, to enter into New York City on or around the date of 9 11. We won't let that happen without his vehicle being searched. It's kind of hard to argue with that. By then, FBI agent Eric Jurgensen had been watching Zazi for a week after the Denver FBI office obtained some very suspicious emails Zazi had written. He was indicating that he needed something very, very quickly. I need this right now, please. And the word marriage was used in those messages as well. That coded term, marriage, was a frightening red flag. The culture of suicide bombers, they'll often use the term marriage to mean an attack. Every martyr is, uh, goes to heaven to receive his maidens. And so it's a term that they use to refer he's getting married. A day after the FBI first saw those emails, agents were trailing Zazi as he sped off, driving around 100 miles per hour from Denver to New York. At that point, when he was going to New York, when he's coming back from New York, we did not have a good handle on what his plans were. When Zazi was stopped on the bridge and searched, he was carrying two of three chemical components needed to make his homemade bomb, the things he'd bought at an Aurora Beauty supply store and mixed together in a nearby motel room. The materials that he had brought with him were in a suitcase within the trunk. They did not search the suitcase. Eventually, they let Zazi go and he entered New York City, still under surveillance, still planning to detonate his bomb in the subway. And at one point during the day, he actually uh, uh, eluded surveillance uh, in the subway and got away from us for a little while. Zazi was riding the trains that go right underneath Times Square here, looking for a place where if he were to set off his bomb, he might kill the most people possible. But the police who were trailing him on that day, September 11th, 2009, they didn't know any of that, only that he was loose on the subway here in New York City. That, that, was, that was a bad time. It was a couple hours. I mean, it was really very short, but it didn't seem short at the time. Agents did find Zazi as they continued to investigate his plot. After they spoke to an imam in Queens, the imam called and warned Zazi. The imam did indicate to him, hey, um, where are you? Uh, Najibullah said, well, I'm, I'm here in New York City. He said, well, interesting because there were some uh, officers who came out here and had your photo. Zazi knew then the game was up. He abandoned his plot and flew back to Denver on a plane packed with FBI agents and marshals. A few days later, we were knocking at his door. Of course not. I have nothing to do with Al-Qaeda. That's what Zazi said two days later when he went in to talk with the FBI. It was Jurgensen in the room with him doing the interrogation. I tend to be a little bit more of the good cop, if you will. Jurgensen knew Zazi's story wasn't adding up. But to get the truth, he had to earn Zazi's trust. What Najibullah told me was he was very incensed he had a problem with innocent women and children dying in Afghanistan at the hands of allied forces. As difficult as it might be for me to think, well, he's fighting us, he wants to kill us here, I, I could relate to him on a certain level because I watched the attacks on 9-11 occur when there were a lot of innocent victims. After three days, knowing that the FBI knew too much, Zazi stopped talking. He was arrested hours later and has been behind bars ever since. When you have somebody in custody, he's out of commission. What you're concerned about and, and where, you, where you need to be worried is the fact that who else is out there? Zazi has now given the FBI information on several co-conspirators. For Jim Davis, who led Denver's FBI office during this investigation, it was a triumphant capstone on his 26-year career. Nothing in my career compares to what we did in Najibullah Zazi. And he doesn't look like a big threat. I mean, he kind of looked like a nice young kid, looked, you know, kind of wide-eyed and, you know, overwhelmed by the whole thing. And I remember looking at it uh, as it was going on and thinking, you know, nobody's going to recognize until we can talk about this case that that guy is Muhammad Atta. You know, it's, he's the same guy. It was a very serious plot, and I believe it would have been devastating. I honestly believe that it would have happened. 
Uh, but I also want to stress that we have not here in this division or anywhere in the FBI ever rested on our laurels on this case. It was a great success. It was a victory, if you will. But the fight's not over with yet.